Okay, so um, just to get started on some formalities, what is your name? My name is Carol McCoy. Great. Uh, where did you grow up? I was born in Kingsport, Tennessee, and I lived there six weeks. Okay. And I lived in Kearney, Nebraska, and Austin, Texas, Bangor, Maine, uh, Louisiana, Alaska, Wisconsin, Germany, Florida, because my father was in the Air Force. Ah. So I went to first grade in Louisiana and Alaska. Wow. How was that for you? I think at the time that it happened, I really was very unhappy because we always moved in January, which was the time that he rotated, and we usually stayed two years at a place. He was able, when we lived in Wisconsin, to get a double assignment. He had to move literally on the base from one uh, assignment to another, but we stayed physically in the same locale. And that meant that you move in the middle of school, you lose all your friends, and when you start, you are the oddball. And um, I never knew anybody for about half a year, and then when you thought you knew somebody, it was time to move again. So as a young person, not too good. After I got to um, college, by that time he retired, I lived at home going to college. It was a lot easier and I had friends and I began to appreciate how that type of a lifestyle benefited me because I was much more flexible in meeting people and how I adapted. But I think it must have been very difficult on my mother who had five children. Yeah. So she, he never, he wasn't there for the first three children when they were born. And he wasn't there when we moved because he got his orders and he went on and she was left to pack everything up. Mm. So she's a real champion. Yeah. Um, Wait so till you have children and you'll understand. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so after all that moving around, it sounds like you settled down in undergrad. Where did you go to undergrad? I went to the University of South Florida. It was a relatively new school. Uh, when I applied for college, I was in Germany. So I didn't know where I was going to go to school. And I said to my father, where should I apply? And he said, well, if you will go to the University of South Florida, I will pay for it. If you want to go somewhere else, you can pay for it. It's the only scholarship I got. So I went, knowing nothing about it. But when I took the, G, the, the SAT, you put down the five schools that you want. So I put them all down, every Florida school, including Florida A&M. And that caused my father to really laugh hard. I had no idea why. Do you know why? It's, uh, at the time, a land grant university for people of color and all male. <laughs> so, I didn't know that either, but they got my scores. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, I'll try anything once. <laughs> so, um, after you went to um, undergraduate, when were you a student at Vanderbilt? Um, I did a work study while I was in college and worked in New York City for nine months with the U.S. State Department Passport Agency and graduated not in June but in December. Um, as a result, I thought, what am I going to do when I graduate? somewhat similar to what you're now experiencing, and I thought of eliminating occupations that I didn't want to do. I had interviewed with the FBI, and I didn't realize they didn't hire women at the time. Uh, I had wanted to go into the Foreign Service, but you needed a fluency in a foreign language, and you had to have a graduate degree. I didn't have either one of those at the time. And I thought, I didn't want to be a doctor because blood is really unnerving to me. I, I just don't like seeing people in pain or any living creature in pain. I don't do well with that. So I thought about law school and I applied to five graduate schools and five law schools. And then I graduated and I went to visit a good friend down in Coral Gables 
who was my sorority president, and it was over the Christmas holidays after I graduated. I know that you probably are not familiar with employment agencies, but they have employment agencies. And at that time, you would go in and they would kind of ask you your background, and they sent me to IBM. And I thought, well, this is good experience. I'm just going to go. I don't live here. I'm just going to do it for the exercise of seeing what it was like. And I got back to the house, and they called up and said, we want to hire you. And I said, well, I don't live here. I'd have to ask my friend if I could live with her. And they said, well, ask her. And I said, I have to ask my parents if I can move here because I don't live here. And they said, ask your parents. And I said, and I don't have a car. I borrowed my father's Volkswagen. He had five if I could borrow his car, because they were on Biscayne Boulevard, and this is Coral Gables. So they kept telling me to ask, and I did all the asking. Everybody said yes, so I went to work for IBM, and when I did, I said, I am staying until I hear from either a graduate school or a law school and save $1,000, because I needed some money to go to school. And the second week in February, Vanderbilt sent me an acceptance, and the next week they said I had to have tuition scholarship. Then the only thing I had to do was save the thousand, which I did. And that August, I came to Vanderbilt Law School. Wow! So it's not quite finish mm -hmm. college and then just in the next three months go to law school. I had a detour. Yeah. Um. So I since you didn't really have a s one single hometown, was there anything that was like strikingly different about Vanderbilt's campus from other places or was it kind of just like another stop? I had never been on a college campus when I came to Vanderbilt except for the University of South Florida and the University of South Florida was built on sand dunes. It was a new school. The population of the class was the the school was about 4,000. To give you a comparison, it's now about 40,000. But at the time, there weren't even palm trees. And it was built right next to Bush Gardens. Um, I, as, as I told you, I commuted. I lived 18 miles from school. So I would get up in the morning, ride with two retired military people who were going to college on the GI Bill, um, go to my classes, and come back. That was my experience of what a college looked like. So when I, I didn't, I never looked at Vanderbilt until I came here and I'd already been accepted. So I, I didn't know what other colleges looked like. And this one was, had trees, had old buildings, <laughs> lots of ivy. I was very impressed with it. It had a big name on the front. So I was, I was looking forward to it, <laughs> you might say. Um, how did Vanderbilt compare in terms of like a campus culture in comparison to University of South Florida? You said you commuted, but I guess like in, were there differences in your classes and like how people behaved? Well, I think there's a big difference in undergraduate versus law school. So yeah. I don't know that that's the comparison that you would really make. I was very active in the university. I was on the newspaper staff. Um, I worked in the library. Um, I joined a sorority. I did a lot of athletics. Did some, um, did some volunteer work while I was there. So I felt like I did a lot at the university, but I never felt a part of it. And I think part of that is not living on campus. If you're a day student, you pick up and leave. You don't eat with everybody else. You aren't there in the morning. And that is a part of a, a family, which I think uh, for an undergraduate experience, um, you miss that if you are a commuter. So you said you joined a sorority. Which sorority did you join? I joined a sorority called FIA, F -I -A, which my first year, it went into Kappa Delta. Okay. So that was one of the national sororities, and we had, because it was such a new college, all of these uh, local sororities were being brought into the national sororities. So it was a very interesting experience. I was eventually vice president of Panhellenic, 
and in charge of Rush, so learned a lot about sororities. Um, can you expand on that experience a little bit? What were maybe some of the things that you learned about sororities? That's a good question, <laughs> and, I, and I will be very blunt with you. Um, I was very excited to pledge a sorority. I like doing things with other girls and other women. I like sports, I like activities, and I thought this was just wonderful. Then we became a national, and I had a big sister who was a senior, and she was doing her student teaching. I told you that I was active, I did all these things, and got blackballed because my there was a real crisis, unbeknownst to me, among a number of the sororities about how the pledges had been assigned to the various uh, sororities, and there was some hint that it had been manipulated by one or two people, and that's probably true, it probably was. So you had people who were very disgruntled about where they ended up, and as a result, some of the older sisters took it out on the pledges. My, they were asking for any comments, and my big sister said, well, I've never seen her because she was never on campus when I was there during the day, and when she was there in the evening, I wasn't there. And that was pretty devastating, so I was left in uh, limbo for about two weeks where I was just like, crushed and then they finally she finally changed her mind and said yes I was doing a good job I really wasn't part of whatever the dynamics were that were going on and I became very active even though I wasn't living on campus I was super active to the point where I was the most active s sister in the sorority and got that recognition about two years in a row, and then I went to New York City. And while I was in New York City, I still got most active because of how they keep the points or whatever. And so there was this reputation of me when I wasn't even there with the new pledges. But one of the things that happened is that before I went to New York, I was a vice chair of Panhellenic. And this was an experience that I loved because I got to meet all of the new um, individuals who hoped to become pledges, and I saw how the system worked, and I had a fairly good memory for looking at names and looking at faces and putting them together, and I would study all of these sheets that they had for the various girls, and there was one young woman from Miami who was a transfer student, two years, 3.8 in theater, blue eyes, black hair, gorgeous, gorgeous. And when I met her, I thought she had a fabulous personality. She was funny, um, she was quick, witted. <clears throat> she didn't get one bid. She was Jewish. I didn't know it, but I thought that was a horrible thing. And I didn't know that they did that, but nobody in Miami would give her a wreck because she was Jewish. And if you are unfamiliar with Miami, there is a big Jewish contingent down there, and there's a very, at the time, old established um, part of this society, kind of like Palm Beach fell into Miami. They would hate to know that, but it's true. And I have to say that that experience really turned me off about sororities. I could not believe that I'm the one that had to deliver the message that she didn't get any biz. I'm the one that handed them out. It was a terrible experience. And I was glad to leave and go on this uh, work study. It was serendipity, it wasn't planned. But I did, and then when I came back, I basically just commuted and stayed at home and really did not go back into participating. I'm hoping that Things have changed since then, but I've never bothered to check it out. Hmm. Was that the story you were expecting? Um, honestly, I'm not surprised by it, but no, it wasn't exactly what I was expecting. 
Um, I should mention that um, I never have told anybody that story. And about 15 years ago, somebody here in Nashville nominated me to win an award, and I was awarded the Order of the Pearl in Kappa Delta for all of my achievements about 15 years ago and flew to Orlando, Florida to be presented with this award. And I, I went, and I, I still have some misgivings about the whole thing, but I do think it serves a very important um, service for a lot of young women if they don't discriminate. And that is that it gives uh, young women your age an opportunity to really kind of test your leadership skills and not have to compete with men. It's the same thing about Girl Scouts. There's leadership training. I think that's important. I think sororities do a lot to boost people's confidences if they don't tear you down. And that's part of the learning process, I think, that those organizations need to learn. They talk about bullies. Um, sometimes that seems to apply to boys, but the mean girls, there were mean girls. And there were mean grown-up women, too. Mm -hmm. And there are still mean girls now, I can <laughs> tell you that. <laughs> All right. Um, so, I guess to, what would be the next place? Yeah. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, did most of the women who attended Vanderbilt with you graduate from law school? Was it common for women to drop out if they got engaged or married? Or was that maybe more of an undergraduate phenomenon? Let me give you some numbers. When I went to Vanderbilt Law School, there were about 450 students. There were 11 women. Oh, wow. Um, we could meet in the one restroom that they had for women. And if you wanted to leave a message for another woman, you just took a little sticky and put it on the mirror because that's the only place you could go to the bathroom. We had originally five um, women in my class out of 163 students. One woman was from Boston, and she had been a science major. She was engaged to get married. She got very, very homesick, and after the first semester didn't come back. She just did not enjoy it at all. The rest of them, the four of us, all graduated. But I don't know that that's really <laughs> reflecting anything. <laughs> the ones in the classes above me, they all graduated. Um, so I don't have a lot to not say lot about to that, but I think Part of it was there weren't a lot of women. I just told you how many women were in class. The next year there were 11 women. The following year there were 25. So that by the time I graduated, we had over 40 women in the law school. And I will tell you, we still only had one bathroom. Wow. How was being a student in law school as a woman when it was kind of that period of going from like five to 40 something. Law school wasn't at all what I thought it would be. And I think that disparity in my first year was very difficult for me. I told you I enjoy doing things with other people and I feel that at that age it was safer to do it with other women. I 